Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much just for this morning, for bringing us here together as your people. Lord, that we have your word, that you have kept your word for us. It is profitable for reproof, for instruction, for doctrine, Lord. And so I pray that um, this morning, all of those things would happen. We'd be re- convicted if we need conviction. We'd be encouraged if we need encouragement. We'd be taught the things that you desire us to know. And we would leave here more like you than when we came in. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 14. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. For even in Thessalonica you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, Sunday mornings are often the biggest shows that happen more than any other day. And I'm not just talking about the extravagant productions that get put on by some churches, the lights, the fog machines. You know, you walk in, are you sure, is this a concert or is this church? I'm not talking about that. The show that I'm speaking of are the ones that are found in the pews and the chairs every Sunday morning. There has been for some time this false thinking that when you come to church, you must make it look like you have it all together, right? Put on a smile, make everyone think that you're good. When people ask, you say, I'm good. Maybe nod your head, shake it a little bit. Maybe, maybe, you know, for a second pause and say, yeah, I'm good because I don't want to share with you what's going on because if I share with you my problems, you might think I'm weak, you might think I'm needy, you might think less of me. The last thing we think we would want is for anyone to think that we have problems. And unfortunately, we come Sunday mornings and put on that show, put on that mask, put on that face, put on that that false sense of strength. Also, others think that we're not weak, that we don't have any problems. But did you know that the church is the place where we should come with all of our problems? I mean, this should be the place... I mean, imagine going to a hospital and everyone there is, is well. You know, this is a little bit odd. Then why'd you come here? <laughs> if your arm's not broken, why are you here? If you're not sick, why are you here? Not that the church is just a hospital for the sick, as it's been some, sometimes and I think oftentimes too, called too much. But the church is a place where we should come with all of our problems. And it's because we come here together to give them over to the Lord and see how he takes care of those problems. What we're going to see in this section and what we've kind of been seeing, in la- especially last week as well, is Paul has some problems, right? He's writing this letter from a Roman prison. He has needs and necessities. He has problems, and instead of hiding these problems, instead of saying, well, you know what, I'm the Apostle Paul, I need to make it look like I have it all together for this church, I need to make it look like everything goes well in my life, well, he kind of lays it out. He's told them his needs. They found out his needs. And instead of him saying, no, 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 don't, don't, don't help me out, we'll see that he humbly accepts their Now going back to verse 14, he said, Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. As we saw last week, Paul was able to be content with whatever situation he was in. And he never tried to burden anyone or any of the churches that he was ministering to. 
Anytime he'd go to a church, he didn't walk in and say, all right, if you want me to stay here, you know, I need to have a nice place to stay. I need to have a weekly salary of this. I need to make sure that, you know, I have a nice security team. In my green room, right before I go up to preach, I need to have, you know, pistachios. I need to have smart water, not spring water. It's got to be the smart water. I need to have the temperature set to 72.5 degrees. You know, it, it doesn't do any of that. Paul was worried about preaching the gospel. And most times, he was actually working while he preached the gospel. We know that when he was in Corinth, a church that had a lot of problems, he worked in the marketplace as a tent maker by day, and then at night, he'd go to the church and preach to them and teach to them. Never trying to burden the church with supporting him, but instead he supported himself. Why? Because he knew the church at the time. Uh, there were more problems than how much is the pastor getting paid. <laughs> there were other problems that, that were at hand. But that doesn't mean, just because that Paul didn't want to burden the church, that doesn't mean that Paul didn't take any gifts or support. We can see here in this verse, nevertheless you have done well that you shared in my distress. We can see here that they did not help Paul out because he sent them a video of how hard his life was as a missionary or because he begged them for their help. But the reason they helped him was because they cared for him. And as Paul says here, they shared in his distress. Now Paul again was in a Roman prison, which in the Roman prisons, how well your stay was depended upon how you could provide really for yourself. And the Roman government didn't provide for you like, you know, our, our governments do nowadays. If you wanted a nice prison stay, well, you better have some deep pockets or you better have some friends that do. And when Paul says that they shared in his distress, he's saying that they almost put themselves in his shoes where he was at. Paul was in a horrible place and, and they said, you know what? Paul, our brother, Paul, our pastor, Paul, the one that loves and adores us and whom we love and adore is in a distressing situation and instead of just saying, well, well that's their problem. I'll pray for you, brother. They made it their problem. They made his problem their problem. Now, problems are a problem in the church today. As I said at the beginning, we often think that our problems should be left at the door, not brought in. Some might even believe that the church should be a place free from problems, and maybe that's what keeps them away from the church. Or, or maybe that's why they don't come as much. They say, well, you know what, I can't come this week because I have problems, and I don't want to bring that into the church. Now, the enemy loves to lie to people like that. The enemy loves to keep people away from the church. You know, I, I, I often tell people, you know, well, as a believer, we will always hear two voices in our head. We'll hear the Lord's voice, and then we'll hear Satan or our flesh. And th they work on a team together, our flesh and Satan, you know. They tag team. And a lot of times, it can be hard to discern. Is this the Lord's conviction? Or is this Satan's condemnation? Now we know as believers, there's now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But sometimes conviction and condemnation, they, they kind of are muddied. And, and we don't know, you know, is this the Lord or is this, this Satan? Well, I've, at least in my own life, I found the easiest way of determining, is this the Lord or is this Satan? See, Satan will do everything he can to keep you away from the Lord. So when you sin, or you have problems in your life, he'll always say, you can't go to church. Look at what you just did. Or look at the problems that you have. You can't read the Bible today. You just, you just yelled at your wife. You just yelled at your husband. Yelled at your kids. The Lord's not gonna speak to you through his word right now. <laughs> you can't pray to the Lord. He knows what you did last night. He's not going to hear you. He knows what you've been doing. He's not going to listen. See, that's Satan. He always keeps us from the things of the Lord. 
Whereas the Lord's conviction always brings us to the Lord. The interesting thing is Satan's condemnation and the Lord's conviction does tell us the truth in one thing, that we have sinned. Right? The Lord says, yes, you did sin. I, I do know what you did last night. I did see you just yell at your wife or your husband or your kids. However, the Lord's conviction tells us you need to go to the house of the Lord and be lifted up by your brothers and sisters in Christ. The conviction of the Lord tells you you need to go to my word and be cleansed by it. The conviction of the Lord tells us you need to pray to me for if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And you know, Satan has this lie where he tells people because they have problems or because they are a problem, they can't go to church. The church needs to be free from problems. And certainly that's a lie from the enemy, but I think that's also helped. We, we help Satan a lot of ways in the way that we act because we don't bring our problems in either. We, we might come to church, but we pretend like we don't have any issues or needs or problems. And so when that person with real problems walks into the church and they start shaking everyone's hand and asking how you doing and every, everyone's fine, right? <laughs> everyone's okay. No one has any issues. Everyone's life is just perfect. Well, guess what? Satan's using that to say, look it, you're the only one with problems here. So we're gonna see here this morning Problems are okay in the church because it gives the Lord an opportunity to work. And usually, let's see, this is one of the best parts about having problems in the church. It usually allows the Lord to use others in the church to help with those problems, help with those needs, help with those issues. And that's what Paul's talking about here this morning. In verse 15, he says, now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. So Paul go, goes over their giving in some sus- specifics. He said before that they shared in his distresses. So they made his problems their problems because as the church, we are to help those with burdens to carry those burdens. Again, they didn't just say, well, you know, that's Paul's problem. You know, he got busted for preaching the gospel. Let's keep our heads low. No, but he even tells them, look, y- you, didn't, you didn't just care about me through words, but in action. Right? They actually sent aid to him when he was in Macedonia and in Thessalonica. They didn't just say, oh, we'll pray for you, brother. But they provided actual needs for him. They fulfilled his needs. Look at James 2, verses 14 through 17. He says, what does a prophet, prophet, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now even in that section, and I want us to um, highlight this because people will take things like this and run with it. But even James says, if a brother or a sister... Paul is here speaking about brothers or sisters in Christ. He's speaking specifically about those in church, your brothers and sisters in the Lord, not just a random person. Now, these are people that worship the same Lord with you, are part of the same body as you, have the same Father as you. And with the church in Philippi, they didn't just care about Paul through words, but in action. Look at verse 17. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Now see, Paul wasn't just saying all this like, oh, I thank you so much for your gift. He wasn't just saying all this to butter them up so they would give some more. 
But instead, he shows us a valuable lesson about giving and receiving. Paul says that he seeks the fruit that abounds to their account. I seek the fruit that abounds. I don't seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. See, when Paul received gifts from them, he knew that even though he could do without the gift, as we saw in the verses prior to this last week, Paul, Paul's like, look, I, I don't need these things. I know how to, how to be abased. I know how to abound. I know how to be rich. I know how to be poor. However, I, I'm not looking for a gift. I'm not looking for these different things. But by accepting the gift that they gave him, he was allowing the Lord to use these people to bless him. And at the same time, they were going to be blessed by the Lord because of the fruit that happens from it. Now this is something that we can often forget about when we speak of giving and receiving. In fact, in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, Paul actually quotes Jesus, which it's a quote from Jesus that's not found in the Gospels, ironically. But there are some quotes throughout the Bible that we have in Jesus that aren't found in the Gospels. And one thing that is in Acts 20, 35 that Jesus says is it is better to give than to receive. But, even though it's better to give than to receive, at the same time, I think we should look at how hard it is to receive. It's something that took me a while to learn myself. Yes, it's better to give than to receive. But a lot of times, it's pretty hard to receive help from others, to ask for help, to receive help. It can be very hard to humble yourself and take help from someone or allow someone to bless you with something. A, a lot of times we think that if we accept the help from someone, we're either A, admitting that we're weak and we needed help. And in our culture, that's, that's not something that's looked upon very highly. That's not something that was looked upon very highly in the Roman culture either. Or we think, oh, now they've helped me. Now I owe them something in return. I'm indebted to them because they helped me. So now I need to make sure that, that I do everything I can, that if, if they need something, I, I'm going to be there to show them that, you know, uh, I'm thankful for their gift. But, you know, now I have to do this. There were many times when I declined people to help me or never brought up that fact that I needed help simply because I did not want to be seen as needy or as a burden to others. But what I never realized, it wasn't until um, having a, a talk with my pastor one day, is that by hiding my needs and my problems, I was actually not allowing the Lord to use people around me to help me. Now, for a second, let me talk about this because um, I have seen many times throughout my years in ministry people abuse this in the church. In fact, I remember when I was um, serving out in California, um, we had a, a, a gentleman come to the church and uh, a new guy and, and me and a couple of the other assistant, assistant pastors, you know, we'd always go up and introduce ourselves and kind of want to get to know who's, you know, the, the people at the church who's coming in. We're a small church, so when someone's new, you know, they kind of stood out like a sore thumb. <laughs> and so we went up to him, we're talking with him, and uh, I, I noticed that um, before I got to talk to him, I noticed that he was having these really animated conversations with, with some people, especially some of the older women in the church, some widows. And I thought, and he was a younger guy, and I was like, well, you know, he sounds like a, looks like a nice guy, but seemed off. Um, as me and a, my, my friend, the other assistant pastor, walks up to him, we start having a conversation with him. We realize that the only reason he was at church, and he admitted it, was he was a traveling musician who uh, went to different churches, and the reason he went to different churches is because he needed help and money, and he knew that people at churches loved to give. He says, well, you know, I'm, only, I, I'm really only here because, you know, I, I need some money and I just know these pe uh, people at churches, they, uh, they, love to, they love to hand out money. Well, uh, we brought him aside and made sure that 
that night he didn't talk to anyone else in the church besides me and uh, the assistant pastor till we whisked him away out of the parking lot. Yeah, no thank you, you're not gonna find that here. I know there's many people like that. And, and you know, they, they'll come and, and, and we get it here from time to time, you know. Hey, I, just, I saw you're a church and I'm just looking for something. Not that we can't help, and at times we have helped in some situations. Most situations, though, we probably don't. And as Paul talks about, he says it also to the church in Galatians that we need to help those in need, especially those of the household of faith. We need to make sure that we we help those and we focus on those in the church before we focus on anyone outside. But that doesn't mean just because there's a few bad apples. And see, I could see a guy like that and say, you know what? I don't want to be a burden to the church. I don't want to say that I need help moving or that I need, you know, my wife's sick or I'm sick or, you know, we need help cooking meals or we need help with this or, you know, I haven't been able to start my car for weeks and I just don't want to ask for help on someone who might be able to help me with it. I don't want to be like a burden or a mooch to the church. <laughs> I remember a good friend of mine um, growing up, um, he was a missionary kid and he, he taught me this uh, amazing word that um, I've seen more in practice than I've actually heard. Um, but the term... Uh, moochinary, not missionary, but moochinary. You know, they go around all the churches and, uh, you know, they, they have all the pictures of, of them with all the orphans and, you know, how you can help them and uh, uh, they, they run their circuit, the moochinaries. But Paul here, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. There's something so interesting about receiving gifts Paul's not focusing on what he gets when he receives a gift Paul here is focusing on what the giver receives the giver receives fruit the fruit that abounds to your account Paul gets to see the Lord use these people this church to help him even though he doesn't need the help, right? Paul could say, oh, I, don't, I don't need your help. Guys, I'm good. The Lord's gonna provide for me. Or I, I know it's okay. I don't need to live comfortably. So please don't give me any help at all. And again, I, I used to be that way. I used to you know, tell people, no, 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 I don't need help. I don't need help. Um, and again, it, it wasn't until some, um, thankfully the Lord brought someone along my path who convicted me and said, you know, you're, you're keeping someone from being able to be used by the Lord in your life. Whether that's a financial gift, whether that's just a physical presence, whether that's, you know, physical help, like I said, if we're moving or doing something or doing that. I, I know uh, there's, there's some guys in the church, they, uh, they are really good at working with their hands and, um, uh, I've learned over the years um, that uh, one of their gifts is helps. And not because, you know, I've been, hey, you know, I got a leaky faucet. Can you fix it? <laughs> uh, but I'll, we'll have conversation, you know, it's something guys do. We like to talk about all things that are broken in our house, right? <laughs> it's like a one-upmanship. Oh, you, you're, you think your sink's broken? Let me tell you about my sink, you know? <laughs> You think it was hard to fix your roof? Let me tell you. And so, you know, we're, we're talking, we're, we're telling each other about all the different things we got going on. And, you know, it's, it's been such a blessing in, in my life. Um, I'll be saying, oh, yeah, we got this going on, that going on. And, and I've had uh, gentlemen from the church show up with their tools, or with the things that I need to fix it. And, and even though I intended to fix it myself, they're like, hey, look, I'm going to help you out today. I'm going to help you do that. One time our, our car was, was um, having some issues and uh, one gentleman, he just, um, he basically, um, if I wanted to, I guess I could have called the police because um, he basically stole my car. But <laughs> he just took my keys and says, yeah, you, I'm taking your car and, and you can use my car because I'm going to fix your car for you. And just, you know, after he knew I was, I was struggling with some 
with some things, couldn't figure out what to do, how to fix it, didn't have the time, and um, he did that. Now, a lot more immature Nick would have been like, oh, no, 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 I don't want to be a burden to you. No, 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 now, now I owe you something, because you did that. But I realized, you know what? That's the Lord's gift they've given that person to go and to bless others with. Why would I want to get in the way of the Lord using that person? And, I, and if I'm being honest, it's still uncomfortable. <laughs> it's still uncomfortable to receive. I, I think that's almost a good tension to have, you know. If you're just always like, yeah, here are my problems. Uh, anyone want to help me? You might want to check your heart a little bit. <laughs> Again, we've had people who, you know, they come in and it's the sob stories every, every time and, and uh, n- not that we can't help or not that we, we don't desire to help, but, um, and not that you can't help even if the person's heart's in the wrong place. If the Lord's calling you and telling you to bless that person, to help that person, well, by all means. In fact, in the Bible, we're told to give without any thought of receiving back in return. Paul says, I seek, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Paul has learned to accept the gift of others, though though it is not needed and not asked for, because he knows the fruit that it produces in the life of the giver. Here in the church, there is a powerful, powerful fruit that abounds when we have our problems and we allow others to help us with our problems. And it's not others that are helping us, as we're going to see here in a second, but it's the Lord that does it through them. Verse 18. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. No matter what they gave Paul, he says here he'd be fine. He goes, again, I didn't need the gift. I'm, I am full and I abound. And I thank you for what you gave me. But notice also how he describes the gift that they gave. It was not just a gift for him. And it was not just fruit for the church. But he says there, it's a sweet smelling aroma to the Lord. Now this points all the way back to the Old Testament and the Old Testament sacrifices. When they would have these Old Testament sacrifices, bulls, rams, goats, turtle doves, you know, flour or incense, if it was done the way the Lord prescribed it to be done, as we've been studying on Wednesday nights in Leviticus, if it's done that way, the Lord says it will be a sweet-smelling aroma to me. What that means is that these sacri- when they make these sacrifices... It was a pleasant aroma that pleased the Lord. When brothers and sisters in Christ come together and help to take care of the needs and burdens of those around them, it pleases the Lord. It pleases the Lord that we go and we help our brothers and sisters. As Paul says to the church in Romans, we are to mourn with those who mourn. We are to rejoice with those who are rejoicing. Part of the, uh, the point of the church is to help carry the burden of others. There is no such thing as the church, in the church as, well, that's their problem, not my problem. Again, as Paul said at the beginning of this, they shared in his distress. They weren't in jail. They were fine. But what did they do? They shared in his distress. They helped carry that burden. When brothers and sisters in Christ come together, man, it pleases the Lord when he sees us being used by him for for helping others. Well, verse 19, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. It seems that when they gave, the Philippian church, they gave out of their own need. And so Paul reassures them, look, even though Paul knew that you guys probably weren't the richest people and yet you're giving to me, Paul reassures them and says, 
don't worry, my God will supply all your needs. Now, this is not a charlatan's tactic to get people to sow a seed of faith. We've all heard this at 3 a.m. on the televangelist channel, you know, when you couldn't sleep. You turn on the TV, and that guy's telling you that to get, you know, oh, you only got $20 in your account? Well, give 40 and take that overdraft fee because God's going to give it back to you. <laughs> it's interesting that these people, they rely on other people to give to them while telling others to rely on God. And when it's like, well, wait a second, why don't you just rely on God? No, they rely on others. They want you to do it for them. But see, even Paul relies on God. That's what he was talking about in the the verses before this when he says that he knows how to be content in all things. Why? Because he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. Paul relied on the Lord. And one of the ways that he relied on the Lord, or, or when he was relying on the Lord, one of the ways that the Lord provided for Paul was how? Was through the church. So even though he's saying, you know, he's giving them a little pat on the back, thank you guys, really what Paul is doing is he's praising the Lord for using the church to bless him. Paul relies on God to provide for his needs and the Lord uses the Philippian church to do that and then the Lord provides for the Philippian church's needs. It's just this cycle, really. In the end, it's the Lord who provides everything. Right? James says that in his letter, that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. So even though you might be receiving help from someone in the church, it's not really from them, it's from the Lord using them. They're just a vessel of the Lord's blessing. It's, it's like the old, uh, old story goes of the, the sailor who's, uh, whose ship's is sinking. And as he's floating in the water, he cries out to God, God, save me. Save me from this. Save me from this and I'll serve you. And all of a sudden, a boat comes along. And they say, hey, sir, do you need saving? He goes, no, I'm, I'm waiting for God. He's going to save me. He says, Okay. And another boat comes along. And, you know, sir, sir, you, you're, what happened? My, my, my ship sunk. I, do you need saving? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, God's going to save me. I'm waiting on God. And the boat goes on. Finally, the sailor drowns. He gets to heaven and he says to God, God, why didn't you save me? And he goes, I sent you two boats. <laughs> and oftentimes we do that with the Lord. We, we expect this, you know, money tree to grow out of nowhere we expect you know our mailbox just to be filled with food we expect our car to just automatically start working and certainly all those things can happen i know people who have had that kind of well not the money tree and um i'm blanking on his name right now their old missionary in, uh, in the UK um, had an orphanage and he, he vowed that he would never take a dime from anyone. Something the Lord had put on his heart. Not something his pride had led him to, but the Lord had actually said, I want you to, to open this orphanage and I don't want you to ask for any money because I'm going to provide for you. It was okay. There was one day where um, he's got an orphanage full of, full of kids and uh, boys and um, uh, they ran. They're running out. They ran out of food, so the the cook goes to him and says, "You know, look, we uh we don't have any food to, to feed the kids today." And he goes, "You know, I think we're going to have to go and ask for some some money." And he says, "No, we're not going to do that. We're going to pray to the Lord. He said He provide. These are His kids. They're His problems. <laughs> Let's see what He does." So they prayed and they prayed. And as they're praying, they get a knock on the door answer the door and it's the milkman the milk you know if, if you don't know what a milkman is they actually used to deliver milk in a little truck or a little wagon and, and the milkman says look um my truck just broke down right here in front of front of the orphanage and i'm not going to be able to fix it in time to finish my route and if i don't well all this milk is just going to spoil 
He goes, and here's this orphanage. Do you guys want it? He says, well, sure. <laughs> and he has countless other stories of similar things happening. Sure, things like that can and will happen. But I found in my life, at least more often than not, the Lord is using just the practical people in my life to help me, to provide for me. When I have problems, whether that's any kind of problem, and I'm not just talking financial problems or physical, maybe they're spiritual problems. Maybe I'm struggling with something. I've seen the Lord use people all around me. And I thank the person, but in the end, I really thank the Lord because it's the Lord who does it through them. Well, finishing up this this section and in this book, really, Verse 21, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And this is a very typical ending to one of Paul's letters, except one interesting thing to note there in verse 22. Paul mentions Caesar's household. Now, this doesn't mean Caesar's literal house, like his wife and kids, or, any, or, or even Caesar himself. Caesar's household was a, a common phrase used by anyone who worked under Caesar or in, in Caesar's government or part of Caesar's kind of group, um, which could be really anyone, you know, in Caesarea, in Jerusalem, not just specifically in Rome at his house. But I think it's amazing that not even a hundred years after Christ, the gospel has already infiltrated the most powerful government in the world. And they're openly saying, yeah, say hi to the church in Philippi for us. The same government that has Paul in chains right now. Paul had brothers and sisters in that government. That's the power of the gospel. No borders or laws can stop it from spreading. It can go anywhere and it can infiltrate the darkest corners of this earth. And as we close up this book, one thing, a couple things to, to take note of is this is not to get us to give more or for us to start asking people how they can bless you. Hey, you know, I've got some problems in my life. Uh, hey, Nick, what's the number to that guy that, that, that stole your car to fix it? <laughs> like, you know, this isn't to encourage you to just, you know, be a burden on the church. Certainly you can be that way with your problems. But it's encouragement to A, to be honest. Paul, Paul was fine letting them know his needs. Paul was fine accepting the gift, but Paul was also fine letting them know that like, I, I don't need these things. See, that's where his heart was. His heart wasn't, I need to have this help. I need to have, I've got these problems and other people need to fix it for me. Paul, as we saw last week, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No matter what his situation was, he was content. But he also knew that just because he was content, he wasn't going to stop people from being used by the Lord in his own life. The main point is that it is the Lord who provides all that we need and so much more. See, the point of this letter has been for the Philippians to look to the Lord for joy, for peace, as an example for strength, for growth, and really for all other things. Everything that Paul has touched on in this letter, he always points back to Christ and says, you know what, don't look to me for these things, look to Christ. You know, you want an example of how to walk? Well, you could have me, Timothy, and Epaphroditus, but guess what, the real example is Christ. You want to have joy? Well, I don't have the formula, but go to Christ where you can find that joy. You want to learn how to have peace in this life? This peace that surpasses all understanding? Well, go to Christ. Do you need to be provided for? Well, go to Christ. Allow Him to use the people in and around your life to provide. And oftentimes He does that. On the flip side as well, we have to be willing to allow the Lord to work through us. We have to not be afraid when people come to us with their problems. 
Maybe they came to you because the Lord's opening up an opportunity for you to be used by him in their life. Not as an inconvenience to you or a burden to you because if they, even if that person tries burdening you, guess what you get to do? You need to give your burdens over the Lord. Cast your cares upon him for he cares for you. We need to allow the Lord to work. I mean, that's the point of the church, right? We allow the Lord to work in us and through us. He's given everyone here a gift for the profit of the whole church. And the last thing we want to do is quench the spirit by not allowing others to work in our life. Just like the Lord's been working in our life. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the book of Philippians, Lord. We thank you for Paul and his example, but most importantly, the example he had of just pointing us to you. Lord, we don't want to look to Paul. We don't want to look to Timothy, Epaphroditus. We don't want to look to our pastors today, Lord, but we want to look to you, the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, the one who provides all our needs, the one who knows all of our needs. Lord, give us the strength to be content with all that we have. Lord, humble us to allow us to be honest with one another. To not put on the show of Sunday morning. Help us look to you for all of our needs. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.